Good morning, First Church. You are in for a treat today. The youth are running the show, and I'm just introducing. So um, you will have a neat opportunity to see uh, some would call the future of the church, and I would say it is the church. And so uh, we uh, are glad you are here. And uh, these, these young folks and Derek Price, our youth director, have put together a tremendous service. Derek will be bringing the message a little bit. Um, there's a few announcements that I want to bring attention to in the, in the steeple. Um, one is the spring renewal coming up May the 1st. It is what I would call a mini revival, one night. And it is a time of praise and worship and preaching. And it will be on May the 1st, 6.30 to 8 o'clock in the Wesley Hall next door. Put it on the calendar. Um, Vacation Bible School is coming up. It, the theme is Set Sail, and it's coming up July the 8th through the 11th. Registration is open. Um, there are QR codes in the, the steeple. If you want, if you're technologically capable or willing, you can use a QR code. There'll be some you'll see with a little name tag or a captain's hat. If you'll talk to them. On the back of their name badge or their, their badge is a, is a larger QR code that may make it easier for you. So put that on the itinerary. Uh, we have a Habitat for Humanity Volunteer Day, Saturday, May the 11th from 8 till 3.30. Um, put that on the calendar. There's, a, there's a, a website to go in and register for that. And then... We have some new members. I'll, I'll let you welcome them if they're here today. And um, just uh, prepare your hearts and minds for worship. This is going to be a special day. And if you would turn and greet your neighbor, stand and pass the peace of Christ to them.
would please remain standing. Uh, Macy McMillan will be leading us in the affirmation of faith this morning. Let's all affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead and ascended from heaven and is set at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please have a seat, and I'll invite all the children to come forward to share in the uh, children's message with Anna Hussey and Madeline Allstone. that is very strong. Can you? Jesus. Jesus? Do you know anybody who's strong? No? Your dad? Do you ever think that you are very strong? Yes? Oh, I love that. So sometimes we may think that we are not strong enough but God is stronger than anything and can help you in any situation. In the Bible, there is this story about a guy named Daniel. He was put into a lion's den. Are lions scary? You think lions are a little scary? In the story, after being put in the lion's den, he knew he couldn't face the lions alone, so he leaned on God's strength and in return, God helped Daniel, and the lions did not bother him at all. So the lions didn't, they didn't mess with him. And then, that's a pretty cool story, isn't it, guys? Well, that shows how strong God is, but he also wants you guys to be strong, too. In fact, there's nothing that you can't overcome when you have him on your side. You'll find a fortitude and resilience that you know didn't existed. And because his power is inside you, he is mighty and he will save you. God's strength is offered to you as a gift. Take that gift and put it to use. When you are weary or don't believe that you can make it through your current situation, turn to him and know that his power will get you through anything. You can't always go through life on your own. And the good news is that you don't have to. He promises to be right by your side, encouraging you all the way, sharing his strength and might with the child he loves. You want to pray with me, guys? Can you repeat after me? Can you say, Father, thank you for your strength, helping me through each day. All right, that's it. Do you want to go back to your, or you want to go to children's? Sure. Thank you, guys. As the children head to Children's Church, Mally McMillan is going to lead us in our scripture reading. Today, the scripture is from 1 John um, 3, 11 through 17. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belongs to evil and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? He, 
because he was, his actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brother and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life when we have loved each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death, and we all know anyone who remains in death is a murderer, and we all know murderers do not have eternal life. Um, this is... This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, so we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can you love how can you have to show the love of God? For the word of God the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Got a special treat this morning, our anthem, Anna Cape Britain. I come to the garden. Thank you for letting us gather together on this Sunday morning. Even though it's gloomy outside, it's Youth Sunday, a day where we get to let our youth lead in worship and fellowship. To talk about you, Lord. Help guide us so we may thrive and spread your word. Watch over us. Help us seek the way you want us to live through the Holy Spirit, and may we follow you. All honor goes to your name. Let us now lift up any prayers or names that may be of concern to you.
now we pray the prayer you told us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The ushers will come forward for receiving the tithes and offerings.
offertory prayer this morning is by Max McMakin. Dear Lord, thank you for all that you give us. Help us to use this offering in a way that will show your love to others and in a way to honor you and glorify you. I pray our offering help our church grow in its faith. We ask that you use this money for your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We invite you to join our hymn, hymn number 191, Jesus Loves You. guys may be seated. Can we just give our youth a quick hand? Hey guys, thank you so much. Um, I've only been here since August, but, but God's done a lot. God's done a lot through this group, and um, it's great to see a little bit of fruit of that this morning. Well, if you guys don't know me, if, if we've not met, my name's Derek Price, and I'm the youth director here at First Methodist Church, and um, I'm really, really excited to bring this message to you this morning. Um, when we put Youth Sunday on the calendar, that was a few months back, Pastor Joel asked me if I'd like to preach, and I said, yeah, of course. So, so I started preparing a, a, a nice, um, you know, uplifting, encouraging message, and then a few days later, Pastor Joel told me I'd be preaching out of James chapter 3. And, uh, if you know if you know what's in James chapter three, you know that the tone of the message um, changed just a bit. But but the Bible says this in Second Timothy chapter three, Paul writes to Timothy. He says, "All Scripture, all Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work." What this means is that. While James 3 presents a challenging message, and this will be a challenging message, God's Word also presents an encouraging message here. Because through that challenge, God is going to grow us in a way that draws us closer to the individual that He's called us to be. If we're going to, if we're going to become who God's called us to be, if we're going to be sanctified, then we're going to be challenged. Amen? Amen. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 3. For today's message on taming the tongue. Taming the tongue. James chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 3. God's word says this. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue 
is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursings. My brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be so. Folks, this is the Word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thank you, God. So, the first truth I want to look at here in this passage of Scripture is pretty obvious. It's that the, that the tongue is incredibly powerful. We all have a tongue, so we all have incredible power in the way we speak. Um, James, James 3 shows us the incredible consequences that come from our words. They can be positive or they can be negative. And, and this is backed up. It's supported all throughout Scripture. Proverbs 18.21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what your profession is. I don't care how much or how little influence you think you have. The Word of God here says that your tongue is extremely powerful. And the words you say, the words that come out of your mouth, have a great, great impact on those around you, those people of, of all ages. And what kind of impact your tongue has, your words have, well, that's up to you. Um, you can build people up. You can tear people down. Proverbs says we can speak death or we can speak life with our tongue. I spent um, several years as a public school teacher, and I, I saw this play out every single day. When kids were spoken into, you speak life into those kids, changes their attitude, changes their behavior, and really can change their direction in life. If we, if we speak to our kids, we build them up, if we speak life into them, then we can have a great positive impact on the trajectory of their life. On the flip side of that, if we tear them down, then, then we can set them up to, to be in bondage, held down by the negative talk that we, that we set that precedent with for the rest of their life. They could be battling that for the rest of their life. But it's not just parents to kids, right? Our marriages can be greatly impacted by how we speak to one another. Our friendships, teenagers, can be greatly impacted by how we speak to one another. <laughs> You know, our relationships with our coworkers, teenagers, there is power, listen to me, there is power in your words that you speak to your parents. Well, how you speak to them, how you speak to anybody, can have a great, great impact on them. And God's Word backs that up, but it's not just how we speak to other people. If you're like me, you probably talk to yourself all day long, right? If you're not talking to other people, is it just me? If you're not talking to other people, then there's a voice in your head. And you're telling yourself things all day long. Well, the Bible says that, that we have a choice. We can speak life or we can speak death to others and to ourselves. Right? We can speak life or death to others or ourselves. Um, and, and here's, I think, a, a good rule of thumb. Who's got kids? Who's got kids in here? Yeah, a lot of us have kids. And we love those kids and we want good things for those kids, right? Right? Um, but we don't always think about that in the moment. If you don't have kids, then you can apply this to maybe think about one person in your life that, that you're closest to and, and means the most to you. Here's a good rule of thumb we can use. If God wouldn't say it to you, don't say it to your kids. And if you wouldn't say it to your kids, don't say it to yourself. Now, if you've, if you've read this book enough, you, not, you know that not everything in here is is happy, right? It, it's not it's not all super um, positive emotion all the time. And the Bible even says that that God disciplines those He loves. That doesn't mean that we can't correct our children. All right. And as as Christians, we should we should hold our brothers and sisters accountable. We should we should lift them up, and we should be pulling them towards God. Amen. But we should be careful 
in everything we say, in everything we say, because there is a great, great impact in our words. Our words have the power. Our words have the power to inhibit others or inhibit ourselves, ultimately, from fulfilling what God has put us here on earth to do. It's God's will that we, that we speak with a godly tongue with one another, that we lift each other up, that, that we, we pull each other further away from the world and sin and closer to God. Okay, And, and the Bible shows us, gives us a clear precedent for how we do that. So what does this mean for us in our everyday lives? Okay, It means that we should, we should, every day we should wake up and before we speak, we should weigh the magnitude of how we speak to everybody of all ages because your tongue is a powerful, powerful tool. We should think about the lasting effect that our words can have on somebody's day, somebody's week, even somebody's life without us realizing it. But how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we control our tongues, especially when God's word explicitly in James chapter 3, verse 8, says that no human being can tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. Well, God's word isn't telling us that the tongue can't be controlled. What it's saying here is that we, by our own will, by our own strength, can't do that. We can't tame the tongue on our own. If the Bible says that every good and every perfect gift comes from above, then I would, I would think that supports the fact that every good word, every godly word comes from above. Amen? Amen? So, we have a choice. We can lean into God. We can walk more closely with God. Or we can just speak how we feel. We can speak in emotion. Either way, we're going to have a great impact on others by our words. But what, what the Bible shows us in, in James 3 and beyond, and, and we'll get into a, a a little bit more scripture here. But in James 3 and beyond, the Bible really shows us that, that if we have a problem in how we speak, if we have a problem with our tongue, our tongue is just the indicator of a greater problem. In other words, the tongue is not the root issue. It's just a symptom. So if the tongue's a symptom of a problem, what's the root issue? What's the cause? Well, Proverbs 4.23 says this. It says, Above all, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. If everything we do flows from our heart, how we walk, how we act, and yes, how we speak, how we talk, if that flows from our heart, then our words are a direct indicator of the condition of our heart. Our tongue is a reflection of of our heart. And what, what I mean here is that something can't come out of you if it's not already in you. Here's what Jesus had to say on the issue. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Meaning that if you want to test the condition of someone's heart, if you spend enough time around them, you want to know what kind of heart they have, just listen to how they talk. Okay? And I want, I want to interject right here. Because this message, as I was writing this message, I had to remind myself several times, this message is for me. So if you got somebody else in mind, flip it around. This message is for you. It's for all of us, okay? Because nobody has a completely pure tongue, because nobody has a completely pure heart. We have a flesh that we contend with, okay? And we all have room to be sanctified, to be improved, to be more like God. Amen? Amen. So let me, uh, let me provide an illustration here. I'm going to get one of my youth to help me. Um, Show you what I mean. Uh, so, Ayla, tell me, what is this? This is a bottle of water. What, what's in it? Okay, if I open it up and I, and I pour it out, what's going to come out? Can, can coffee come out? How about grape juice? Mountain Dew? Okay, so we've established this is a bottle of water, right? All that's in it is what? Okay, all that can come out of it is? Okay, your heart is the bottle. Your tongue is the cap. If it ain't in you, it can't come out of you. Okay? Now, that's the message. That, that's the message in changing your tongue. All right? Now, we, we can take corrective action. Um, some people have swear jars. Maybe some of you guys, when you grew up, you, your mouth was washed out with soap. And that'll, that'll make you think about making that move, right? But that'll only cure the symptom. We're going for the root issue. And the root issue 
of an ungodly tongue is an impure heart. Is an impure heart. Um, in, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus uh, is having a conversation with a group of Pharisees. And you guys know the Pharisees, that they have an issue. And this issue is, is self-righteousness. And again, according to Proverbs, what we just read, God's Word says that above all else, we should guard our, guard our hearts because everything that we do flow, flows from it. So self-righteousness, just like any other sin, is ultimately not an issue of how we walk, talk, or act. It's an issue of what's in our heart. These Pharisees, they think they're better than everyone else because they do a good job of following ceremonial law really closely for everybody to see. And these are the same people, you know, who, who pray out loud in public. There's nothing wrong with praying publicly, but they do it just so they can be heard, right? So their intentions, clearly, as Jesus shows us, their intentions aren't pure because their hearts aren't pure. So listen to what Jesus tells them, starting in Mark 7, uh, verse 15. He says, There's nothing outside a person that by going in him can defile him, but the things that come out out of a person or what to follow him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And here's what he said to his disciples. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person, they're talking about ceremonial food law, from outside cannot defile him. That's not what it's about. Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. Thus Jesus declared all foods clean. Praise God. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. Here's what Jesus was saying. He was saying, it's not just about checking the right boxes and doing the right things to look good. There, there's nothing wrong with, with procedural, living a good life that others see and see that you and Christ are living a good life. But if you're not doing that from a pure heart, then, then that means nothing. Then it's just empty religion. The goal here, the, the whole goal, is to transform our hearts. That's what, that's what Jesus came for. That's what he gave, this, gave us the, the gift of the Holy Spirit for, to transform our hearts. And, our, and if we transform our hearts, we transform our lives. Okay? And transforming our hearts, we transform our tongues. We transform our words. Let me give you a few examples of how the tongue can be a great indicator of the condition of the heart. If you sometimes have a harsh tongue or a critical tongue, that probably means you have anger or unforgiveness in your heart. <clears throat> if you find yourself speaking with a negative tongue, that probably is revealing that you have some fear in your heart. If you have a boastful tongue, you have to tell about everybody about how good you're doing, all the things you got, then probably little pride and insecurity in your heart. If you have a judgmental tongue, there's probably a little guilt and shame residing in your heart. So we want to fix our hearts, obviously, but, but the question becomes this, how do we do that? How do we fix our hearts? This is a great question. First of all, the first thing we have to do is we have to be willing to be honest with ourselves. Writing this sermon made me check myself several, several times. And that list I just gave you, there's some way I can identify with every item on that list. And if we're all honest with ourselves, we probably all can, right? God doesn't call us to be sinfully perfect, though. He calls us to lean into him. He calls us to strive to, to live with as pure of a heart as we can. That's what sanctification is. I'm, I'm, better, th I'm better than I was if you guys would have met me a couple of years ago, and if you guys would have met me five years before that, I'm better than I was then, right? God's growing us. He's sanctifying us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, our heart is being changed. But we play a role in that, right? We definitely play a role in that, and there's definitely a way that we can go to God and we can ask God to transform our hearts, to put in us a pure heart. Psalm 139, one of the most well-known psalms, in verse 23 and verse 24, the psalm reads this. It reads, search me, this is a prayer, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there's any grievous way in me, 
and lead me in the way everlasting. If you guys are familiar, you know that this is a psalm of David. And the Bible calls David a man after God's own what? Man after God's own heart. Now, if you know David, you know David messed up pretty bad, right? But the Bible still calls him a man after God's own heart. Because God doesn't measure David. He doesn't measure his heart by what he's done, by the sins he's, he's committed. He measures his heart by the, by the condition of his heart, by his intentions. And despite David's mess-ups, he goes to God and he just says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. I don't care where you are in life. I don't care how old you are. That should be a prayer that we all have every single day. God, I know I do not have a perfectly pure heart. Search me, Lord. Show me what's in there. Show me how I can change. Show me how I can be transformed. Show me how I can be more like you. But if we're going to do that, we have to, we have to invite God in and allow him to change our hearts. Okay, and God gives us a great tool to do that. You know, where, where a med medical doctor, he may use some sort of medical tool to go in and examine the physical heart to see its impurities, to see where it's not pure, where something's off. As followers of, of Christ, we have a different tool that we can use to examine our own spiritual heart. Hebrews 4.12 says this. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Man, when we open ourselves to this word, when we spend time in this book, it is living and active, and it is sharp. And this sword will cut you open a little bit. It'll peel back the layers. And God will expose to you what is really in there. If you're sitting here this morning, and you're thinking, man, I can't think of, I can't think of where I'm off in any way. You probably need to get in the Word just a little bit more, because God will expose that. And that's okay. And that's okay. It's what He gives us His Word for. Let me remind you, He doesn't, he doesn't call us to be sinfully per perfect, but He calls us to grow in sanctification. And if we're going to make our hearts more pure, we've got to spend more time in the Word. We've got, allow, we've got to allow God to tell us where our hearts can become more pure. And if, if we do that, if we seek God, if we stay in His Word, we let Him speak to us, we let Him show us where we can change in our heart, then our speech follows, our tongue follows. We begin to no longer speak with a negative or a harsh or a boasting or a judgmental tongue. We begin to speak with a godly tongue. We're not speaking death over people, cursing. We're speaking life into people. We're speaking blessing over people's lives. And when we do that, when we speak with a godly tongue, man, when we talk to our kids on the daily, we are speaking life into them that can change the whole trajectory of their path and where they end up in life. Your words are so, so powerful to your kids. In our marriages, if we just take the time to ask God to search our hearts, change us, and help us to speak with a more pure tongue, out of a more pure heart, our marriages, y'all, will thrive. There will be more peace. There will be more love in your household. And God can do a greater work through that marriage. In our friendships, in, in our relationships with our colleagues, if we just speak to each other out of a pure heart with a more godly tongue, then God can move in that relationship. God can have his way. That's God's will. When we, when we, when we do God's will, then we see his kingdom come. We see him have his way in our lives. Same is true for you guys. When you speak to your parents in a godly way, out of a pure and godly heart, do not underestimate the impact that you can have on their lives, as well as your friends, as well as your siblings. Y'all, if we came together as a church, 
and we just asked God individually every night. We prayed that same prayer that David prayed. God, show me what's in my heart and change me where I'm wrong. Make me more like you. If we all did that, God would have his way here. God would do exceedingly, abundantly more than you could ever think, you could ever imagine through this ministry. Out of, out of a pure heart, we speak pure words, and, and we see blessing flow from God. And that is the will of God. So James 3, James has a, has a strong, straight-to-the-point message. In verse 8, he says, No human being can tame the tongue. And he's right. No one in this room has the power on their own to make their speech perfectly pleasing to God. But we do have a God that has the power to transform and purify our hearts. And if we allow him to do that, then out of a pure heart, our tongue will speak life, will speak blessing to all those around us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for this gathering this morning, God. We thank you for your word. God, thank you so much for these youth. God, I uh, thank you for, for how you're changing their lives, how you're changing their hearts. God, I thank you for, for how you continue to change my heart. Lord, I ask that you, you show, us, show us where we're missing the mark, God. Put in us a pure heart, God. Show us how, how we can be more like you and how we can please you in our hearts and through the words we speak. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn, hymn 2223 and the faith we sing. Hymn 2223, they'll know we are Christians by our love. So as we go today, let us invite God to align our hearts with his. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.